So shall we pray? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, our Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, and we thank you for the beautiful community. As we come to deliberate upon your word, we ask you to send your spirit among us to enlighten our minds and hearts, to know you better and to draw closer to you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I hope it works better. Okay. How about that? Yeah, um, for those who do not know me, I am Father Godfred Boachi Iadom from Ghana. And uh, I've been a priest for 16 years. Uh, eight years teaching in the major seminary in Ghana, forming priests, uh, seminarians to become priests. I did my theological studies and biblical studies in Cincinnati, uh, the Athenaeum of Ohio in Cincinnati, St. Mary's. And uh, I'm working on my doctorate in Marian studies. Uh, at the University of Dayton. So currently I'm writing my dissertation on the Gospel according to John. Uh, Father David told me yesterday if I could serve for him, and I said, why not? My life of priesthood has uh, always been in the classroom teaching, and I like the informal setting like this. So I'm going to present a few things, and I'm going to take questions from you, because questions stimulate the chat. So it's going to be a chat, not so much uh, kind of presentation. Uh, Father said, uh, today we have to talk about the anointing of the sick and the dying, the sacrament of anointing of the sick. I gotta just hit the button and turn on. Otherwise it won't be on the DVD. No, that one. So Father David said, we have to talk today about the anointing of the sick. You know, there are seven traditional sacraments. And one of these sacraments is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. And the main purpose, purpose for anointing the sick is bringing the compassionate presence of Christ into the midst of the suffering of those who are ill. You know how it is. You know how irritating it is to get sick, even just by cold, you know, suffering from cold. So So when we talk about the sacrament of anointing of the sick, we are talking about bringing Christ, the compassion of Christ, into the lives of the suffering of those who are sick. And basically, when people are sick, you know, they are irritated and uh, things are so ugly, let me put it that way. And so they need the support, especially the support of Christ, to be in their midst, to help them out. So, <clears throat> Christ in his ministry spoke basically about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is close at hand. Repent. You know? So Christ wanted people to enter into the kingdom of God. The kingdom he himself came to inaugurate. But 
he was also concerned about the physical needs of people. So I will read from Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12, the healing of the paralytic. Mark 2, 1 to 12. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it became known that he was at home. Many gathered together so that there was no room, no longer room for them, not even around the door, and he preached the word to them. They came bringing to him a paralytic carrying, carried by four men. Unable to get near Jesus because of the crowd, they opened up the roof above him. After they had broken through, they let down the mat on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Child, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there asking themselves, Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who but God and law can forgive sins? Jesus immediately knew in his mind what they were thinking to themselves. So he said, Why are you thinking such things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, Pick up your mat and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins on earth, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your mat, and go home. He rose, picked up his mat at once, and went away in the sight of everyone. They were all astounded and glorified God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. So, this is a place Jesus came back home and people heard about what he has done and the message he had for the people. So there was a big crowd in the house and these friends had a guy who was paralytic. They wanted to take him to Jesus and they couldn't because of the crowd. So, you know, the typical Palestinian times uh, you could go, you know, and climb the ladder, go to the roof made of straw and lower, you know, the person. So that was easy to do. But it takes faith to do what they did. We become so frustrated when you don't get our way. We become so frustrated and give up when things do not go the way we want. But these people never gave up. For the love for their friend and the faith they had in Jesus, they went an extra mile, removing the straw that covered the room, and then they lowered the paralytic on the stretcher right in front of Jesus. And Jesus, seeing the faith of these people, said, Your sins are forgiven. But the Pharisees and the scribes were there. And who can forgive sin except God? Jesus is from Nazareth. He's a carpenter's son. He's that little boy who gathered a few disciples who were fishermen, not even the learned. They were not even from Jerusalem. They were from Galilee. You know, no entities. Who is he to forgive sin? He has blaspheming and they were finding a way to eliminate him. And Jesus asks them, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? And for you to know that the Son of Man has the power to forgive sins, he told the man, get up from your mat and walk. And the man got up and began to walk. So you see that Jesus came and in many instances healed people. This week we heard about somebody who was a leper. And lepers were ostracized from society. You know, when I was writing my thesis on HIV AIDS, I, I made a paradigm study about people who were paralytic in the time of Jesus and those who are suffering from HIV AIDS today, how they are ostracized and how they are discriminated upon. And uh, this man went to Jesus and he prostrated before Jesus, worshiped literally, and he said, if you wish, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, yes, of course, he touched him and said, be healed. And the man got up and said, go and perform the sacrifice that is prescribed in the law, according to Moses, to the priest, 
so that you will be readmitted to society. But the man went out and that was not the most important thing to him. The most important thing is to give praise to God for what he had experienced. And he went telling people about all that has happened to him and a lot of people flocked to Jesus. He became a disciple. He became an evangelist. He became an ambassador who brought people to Jesus. So in Jesus' ministry, he was not only concerned about the salvation of souls, he was also concerned about the physical needs of people. Now you look at Matthew chapter 25, he said, I was sick and you visited me. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was naked and you clothed me. I was homeless and you took me home. So Jesus is concerned about both the spiritual and the physical. Because the human person is both corporeal and spiritual, a composite of body and soul. You cannot, you know, separate the body from the soul. We only make a distinction. So human beings are body and soul, and the salvation work of Christ is total. It's total. It involves the body and the soul. So Jesus doing all these things was concerned about your sins are forgiven, get up and walk. But in whatever case, faith of the people was more important. You remember Jesus went to other places and he healed a lot of people. He came to Nazareth where he, gave, he, he, he was brought up and he couldn't do many miracles. Why? Because of their faith. Faith is important. The faith of the friends was necessary for this man to receive a total healing. So we could see that all those who came to be healed that day received only physical healing at most. But it was only the paralytic, the one who was handicapped from the beginning, who alone received the integrity of healing. He was the only person who received spiritual healing and physical healing. So the sacrament of anointing of the sick deals with both aspects of healing. It deals with physical healing if God wills it so. And it also has to deal with the spiritual healing of the person. So in the sacrament of anointing of the sick, it is Jesus who touches the sick through the ministry of the priest to heal them from sin and sometimes from physical healing. In all the sacraments, we say, I mean, those who know about the Baltimore Catechism or the Catechism of Trent says that the sacraments are the interior manifestation of the reality in which we encounter Christ to receive the grace of God. So it's an external manifestation of an internal reality. That's what Trent says. So in every sacrament, we see the physical manifestation, the things that the priest does, the words that he says. But there is something more to it. It gives something that is within that spiritual, you know, upliftment, the grace enabling us to share in the life of God. So when we talk about the anointing of the sick, the priest is in persona Christi. It is not a priest who heals. It is not a priest who grants the grace. I am nobody to give you grace. Grace comes from God. So God works through the instrumentality of the priest in bringing healing spiritually and physically to the downtrodden sick person. So anytime you encounter any sacrament, it is not the priest. It is the priest acting in the presence of Christ. So it is Christ who forgives sins. It is Christ who baptizes. It is Christ who heals. Now, so if Christ was concerned about both physical and spiritual inner healing, he touched people who were sick. He healed them. And he helped them spiritually. The church, which is the body of Christ, the presence of Christ in the world, continues that ministry. You know, Schnackenberg talks about three epochs 
or three periods of salvation history. And he says the first epoch is the time of Israel. The second season or time is the time of Christ. And the third season is the time of the church. Jesus said, I am going to my father and your father. And he said, all authority in Matthew chapter uh, 28 verse 20 he said all authority on earth has been given to me and I task you the Greek said and I task you I challenge you to go and make disciples of all nations but the translation will say and I commission you to make disciples of all nations baptizing them and we can know what follows in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I taught you while I was with you. And behold, I am with you to the end of time. I want you to emphasize that. And behold, I am with you to the end of time. So which means that Jesus is with us. He is with the church. And his name is Emmanuel, God with us. So God does not cease to be with us. So in the same way as Jesus was yesterday, Jesus is today and Jesus will be tomorrow. So if Jesus healed the sick, Jesus continues to heal the sick through the mission of the church. Jesus continues to heal the sick through the instrumentality of his minister that he has commissioned. So today we are talking about the ministers of the sacrament who are commissioned to continue Jesus' mission by making Christ present who in turn heals physically if that's the will of God and spiritually so how does the church continue this ministry there are Catholic families who are caring for the sick isn't it there are no people who spend all their time caring for the aged and the sick I have a friend in Cincinnati uh, I was just talking with her on the phone and he was telling me about her mother the mother is 101 years old, confined to bed. And she herself is 75. And she says, Father, I'll spend a couple of time, a lot of time with my mother together. And I want to spend the last days with her. Not taking her to the nursing home until the unfortunate happens. We want to be together. And I could see, anytime I go there, the sacrifices she makes. She loves traveling and she has been to Africa four times and said, I miss going to Africa. I cannot go now because I have to take care of my mother. She loves to go on cruises. Now she cannot go because she has to take And I know a lot of people are sacrificing a lot in taking care of their sick family members. That is a ministry. And I tell people when you are taking care of the sick, don't get so upset. Don't get mad with God and say, why this? Why is it that she is or he is confined to bed? And why is it that I am suffering and I'm wasting all my time and energy? You know, God knows how you could get closer to him through that. So when I was ordained, I put something down. That difficulties and challenges might befall us in our day-to-day -day activities. But those who know how to handle that with equanimity, these challenges eventually become the stepping stones enabling them to reach their God. So somebody might be sick, seriously, in your family, and you got to spend a lot of time sacrificing all your interests for the sake of that person. That is a blessing, because you are carrying out the ministry of Jesus. How about the Catholic hospitals? You might not see it better here because uh, you go to even Catholic hospital, you pay a huge sum of money. It's a kind of a commercial entity. But when you come to Africa, where I come from, the Catholic hospitals were located in the remotest part of the country, where people had no access to health care, where there's no even transportation, there's no water, no electricity. These are where the hospitals are located. These are the places where the people cannot even afford to pay their medical bills. But the church sees the hospitals and clinics established 
as a continuation of the ministry of Jesus to the people. It's a mission. It's not so much to get money. It's a mission. And I remember one of our hospitals, St. Martin's Hospital, that is dealing with Buriri ulcer cases. And uh, Buriri ulcer is a kind of ulcer that begins like with, with a ball, like, like a growth on the skin. And it begins to eat of the flesh until the bones become exposed. You know, it's caused by some kind of material, and it's the opposite of leprosy. And children are affected, and the bishop called me and said, this guy cannot pay their bills, and we cannot afford to maintain the hospital. We got to fold up. Then I wrote to the bishop, I said, why do we fold up? These people have no hope. The church is the beginning of hope. In the church and through the hospital, they see the healing ministry of Christ. When you fold up, what message are we preaching? Pump money from other areas to the hospital and take care of these people who need Christ. And the hospital is working. And anytime I do mission appeals, I ask people and I get help. And I got two medical students from Cincinnati who are there for their rotation, working at the hospital. And the joy is that Jesus is present in our world. But he's present through the instrumentality of other people especially the church which is the body of Christ. There are other individual members of the church who have been blessed with the gift of healing through the Holy Spirit and I have experienced that myself. In Ghana I saw that during the charismatic convention that somebody I knew got healed. There was this lady who was part of the youth movement at the cathedral. The cathedral was packed and during the benediction and adoration this girl threw the crutches away. And since then, I've never seen this girl with the clutches again. He was suffering from polio. So Jesus continues to heal, but it's not common. Also, how about the pilgrimages to the shrines, to Lourdes? A lot of people go to Lourdes to seek healing, and some get their healing. So through miraculous way, people are healed today. But today, we are concentrating on one type of healing, which is the sacrament of anointing of the sick where the church continues the ministry of healing of Christ. So the anointing of the sick is not just a sacrament for those only who are at the point of death. Hence as soon as any one of the faithful begins to be in danger of death from sickness or old age, the fitting time to receive this sacrament has already arrived. That is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church 1514. You know, traditionally, we used to call that the extreme unction. That is a name that erupted from the 12th century. So when we say it is extreme unction, it means that the case should be an extreme case. When somebody is at point of death in coma, then they call the priest to come. But Vatican II says that it's not extreme unction. It's the sacrament of anointing of the sick and the aged. So it's not for us to wait until somebody is unconscious or is panting for death. Then we call the priest to anoint. Anybody in your judgment who is having a serious sickness or somebody who is weak due to old age needs to be anointed. And let me tell you, through my pastoral experience, I worked at the cathedral parish. We had five masses over the weekend, and I had 36 mission churches back in Ghana. And some of them were like 48, 52 miles away from the parish center. But the roads are nothing to write home about. Here, 52 miles would be nothing. Driving from Cincinnati through Nashville, like over 600 miles, and that was nothing. But let me tell you, if I'm to cover 40, 52 miles, that can take me two and a half hours because of the nature of the roads. And if it's during the wet season when there are rains, anything at all could happen. But anytime somebody came, you know, and, and they came from the villages, they walk or they have a bicycle and they ride on the bicycle and come to the parish center to tell you somebody is sick and needs to be anointed. You cannot sleep. You have to get up. Whatever you're doing, stop and go. 
The worst thing that can happen to a priest is to refuse to go on a sick hall and the person dies. It will haunt you forever. And your ministry is affected. Because the person needed you at that time. And at the point of death, he needed you. So when somebody is seriously sick, in your own judgment, you think that a person needs to be anointed, call the priest. And the priest will come, pray, and anoint the person. So you don't wait until when things are so worse. And I remember when I was a kid, when they called father to come and anoint somebody, the family is crying because, oh, he's going to say, oh, pack and go, the time is up. Because they knew, all they knew was anointing extreme unction. So when the priest comes, oh, the priest is going to kick him to the grave. <laughs> but we are not there to push people to the grave. We are there to continue the sacramental healing of Jesus. We are there as instruments of Christ to bring comfort, to bring courage, to deepen faith, to help people to see that they are not suffering alone. Christ is with them. The parish community in the presence, the person of, of, the, of the priest is with them. But I saw them. They'll be crying because father is there. And every time father comes and he anoints the person, it doesn't take 24 hours and they die. Just because they call the priest only when the person is dying. But when we talk about anointing, a person can receive anointing several times. So if somebody is anointed and he's sick at the hospital or in the house, and the sickness becomes worse, call the priest again, even if it's two days interval. Call the priest again. How about if the person is sick and he was or she was anointed and then he got well and he got sick another day, do you need to call the priest? Yes, you do. There are three sacraments that registers an indelible mark on the soul that cannot be repeated. Baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. Baptism cannot be repeated. There can be conditional baptism. But if a baptism is noted to be valid, it cannot be repeated. Confirmation cannot be repeated if we know it's a valid confirmation. And the holy orders, you cannot be ordained twice. So these three sacraments have an indelible imprint on the soul and therefore cannot be repeated. All other sacraments could be repeated. And so is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick and the urgent. So the person was sick and he's anointed and after some time he got sick again, he could be anointed and he gets sick again, God does not permit that. But we, we anoint the person again. So if he gets seriously sick ten times, within one month he'll be, he could be anointed ten times. If he so wish to be anointed. Also, when people are going through a dangerous procedure or surgery, you know, due to some serious uh, illness, the person could be anointed before the surgery. You can ask for it, and you will never be denied of the sacrament. But in any sacrament, there are two basic principles that govern each sacrament. In Latin, we call ex opere operato and ex opere operantis. Now, let me come down. Ex opere operato means that the sacraments are valid when they are administered by the right minister with the right form and the right words. The validity of the sacrament does not depend on the worthiness of the minister. Why? Because it is Christ who is administering the sacrament. Christ who brings healing. It's Christ who gives you the grace. It is not me. I don't have it. I'm only being used as an instrument to bring that. You know, my life as a priest, you know, if it is not a wholesome life, I cannot be a true icon for believers of who Christ is. 
but it doesn't affect the validity of the sacrament that I am administering. We'll pick this up some other time. And the other thing is ex opere operantis. The person receiving the sacrament should be in a better disposition, a proper disposition. He should have the intention of receiving the sacrament. So children who have the age of reason and know what the sacrament is about can also receive the sacrament. So in anointing of the sick is based on the disposition of the person receiving and also the disposition of those who are present, the family members who call the priest. Because it's a communal celebration. It is a liturgical celebration. So it is not a personal celebration. That is why when I come to your house to anoint somebody, all Catholics who have faith in the sacrament need to be around so that we pray together. It's a communal celebration. And today, uh, we are having anointing of the sick within masses in most parishes to show that the anointing of the sick is a communal celebration, not an individual or private, private affair. So who is the minister of the sacrament of anointing of the sick? It's only the bishop and the priest, not the deacon. Because at times it involves the interior forum. When we talk about interior forum, the person who is administering the sacrament should be under the vow of secrecy. The vow of secrecy is, you know, you come to me in confession or counseling, I have no right to divulge whatever has transpired between me and you. Even the laws of the United States exonerates me from testifying in any way that will break the seal of sacramental confession. That's what I mean by internal forum. And that makes sense logically because if it's not me, if it's Christ, then I wouldn't have known it if it was not through the sacrament. So if you want testimony, go to Christ and get that testimony and not me. I'm only a poor instrument of the Lord. You know? So it's only the bishop and the priest who can anoint the sick. But every sacrament has its form and matter. Every sacrament has form and matter. Baptism has the matter of water and the form of I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know? So the sacrament of anointing of the sick also has the form and the matter. The form, uh, the matter is the oil that is used to anoint, the olive oil used to anoint. And that oil is blessed once a year by the bishop during the mass of oils. Tuesdays, normally in most cases, Tuesday uh, of Holy Week. All the priests will gather at the cathedral and there will be the mass of oils and the oils will be carried to the parishes. These are the, so at the end of the year, whatever is not used is disposed reverently. We don't use it after one year. So we go and get one. But the law also permits me in case of emergency when these oils are not around. Most priests will carry the oil in their cars because of emergency. But if it's not there, any edible oil could be blessed by the priest at that time and used for the anointing of the sick. Once that oil is used, the rest is disposed. You can't keep that one. So it is only the bishop that has the power to bless the oil, not any priest. You can only bless the oil during emergencies when you don't have the oil with you. But when you bless and use it, whatever is left has to be disposed reverently. So when we come, you call me for a girlfriend. Um, somebody is sick, could you come to anoint him? We ask a few questions, then I drive to the place and I come there. What am I going to do? I come and agree we have a pep chat. And then we begin the celebration. We have a short penitential ride. Because the sacrament of uh, anointing of the sick has to do with also forgiveness of sins, if need be. 
So we go through the penitential ride to ask God for forgiveness and mercy for the person. And then we also have the sharing of the word of God, liturgy of the word, where we deepen the faith of the person and those around and we encourage members not to give up but to pray as Jesus wishes. And then the priest will lay his hand on the sick person. In most cases, Jesus will lay his hand on the sick and say, get up, stand up and walk. So symbolically, the priest will lay his hand on the sick person. And after laying the hands on the person, he is going to anoint the forehead and the palm with the oil of the sick. You know, there are three different oils in the church. The oil of catechumenate, the oil of, of the sick, and then the oil of chrism. Catechumenate for catechumen, oil of chrism for baptism and confirmation, and then oil of the sick for those who are sick. That needs anointing. So, <clears throat> the priest is going to bless, uh, use the blessed oil for the forehead and the hand of the sick, saying, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. The Lord, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. So now you know why the penitential right is necessary. The Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. So the sacrament is about salvation. The sacrament is about the freeing of sin. The sacrament is about raising the sick person back to life. But what about if you go and all the signs show that the person doesn't have the chance to survive? The prayers, which is the form, are also modified. And there we say, you know, for those who are about to die, the church offers penance, anointing of the sick, and the Eucharist as viaticum. You know, Latin when you say viaticum is food for the journey. What journey? Now, that brings me to the point that we are here on transit. That's not our home. We are here on transit. We are citizens of God's kingdom. So we are passing through. And, and those who well, had transit visas before, you have transit, it's only a short time stay, and you don't have any benefit. You can at times, in most cases, you cannot even go outside the airport. So this is a transit, you know. But we came from a place, we're going back, but we are here on transit. But while we are on transit, we got to buy our tickets in installment through good deeds, through pious act, so that we one day get to where we come from. So the viaticum is food for the journey. You know Isaiah, when he fought with the, the prophets and the priests of Baal and getting them slaughtered, when he brought fire to consume the wet uh, 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 wood, and he, his life was in danger, he fled and went to Mount Horeb. And the Lord appeared, the angel appeared to him and said, take something and eat, otherwise the journey will be too long for you. That is food for the journey, viaticum. And that is not just physical food, but it is a spiritual food. Because when we receive the body of Christ, we come to communion with Christ. When we receive the body of Christ, we are in communion we come to oneness with Christ and so in that sense when person receive the sacrament of the Eucharist as communion as viaticum the person is also emerging himself or herself into the paschal mystery of Christ the passion the suffering and the death of Jesus and we know the paschal mystery was the one that brought about our redemption isn't it when we receive the Paschal mystery, we encounter the Paschal mystery, it's about our salvation. It's about our redemption. So anybody who is in the point of death, in that suffering, is also transmitted into that mystery 
where he or she comes to communion with Christ so that he or she will make the journey with Christ. And that's what we need. I think that is the best assurance we can receive at the point of death. When we are so confused and we are sure that Christ is with us. 14 and 15. He said, Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. So that's the basis of this sacrament. Is anyone among you suffering? He should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? He should sing praise. How about, is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of the faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Now, the Greek talks about kamnonta. Kamnonta means a grave sickness, serious sickness. It's not just any sickness. Oh, I had a headache. Let me call Father to anoint you. Oh, I had a toothache. Let me call Father. Oh, I couldn't sleep last night. Oh, Father, come anoint me. No. That would be the abuse or misuse of the sacrament. But he say, kamnonta means a serious sickness. That's the word used by James. So if somebody has a serious sickness, not necessarily a sickness that's leading to death, any serious sickness, let him call. He said, who? The hoi prospitoroi ho ecclesia. The priest, the presbyters, the priest, not just like this, the priest of the church. And people will say, well, it's, it's calling the, the presbyters are the elders of the church. Oh, we are all priests, and therefore every member of the church. We are all priests, but we are, not, we are not priests of the church. We are priests. By the fact of our baptism, we are priests. But he said, call the priest of the church. So which means that we are talking about sacramental priesthood. Call the priest of the church. That's why the church will say it's only the bishop and the clergy who can administer the sacrament. And he said, let them pray over the sick person and anoint the person with oil. And he said, when they are anointed, what will happen? You anoint with oil in the name of our Lord. And that's why we say, through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord who frees you from sin, save you and raise you up. So it is the Lord. It's not me. So the Lord and the prayer of faith. That's why I'm saying Ex opera operantis. The faith aspect has to be there. So the faith has to be there will save the sick person and the Lord will raise him up. This reminds you of the same words and raise you up. And if he had committed sins, he will be forgiven. So from today, I would like you, if anybody in your family is sick, don't say it's extreme unction and therefore I'm not going to call the priest, the priest is going to anoint him and he's going to die. No. It's the sacrament of the sick. God bless you all. Amen. Catholics are willing and interested, do we also bring them into this? They can come. Why not? Jesus will not say you're not a Catholic. Only that you cannot receive the sacrament if you're not a Catholic. But of course, if they want to support a sick person and come, they can also join their prayers to us. And then another little question is, well, maybe a big question. Okay, let's say that I'm my brother's 
nurse and he's sick and, and, and we have this relationship where I'm giving up my life to take care of him mm -hmm. and he's not Catholic but I have faith and I'm his caregiver mm -hmm. would there be any anointing of sick to no we cannot anoint him because the baptism you know in the church is the doorway to all the other sacraments it, the person has to be a, uh, a Catholic we can pray for the person but we cannot use the oil to anoint the person. Is it because he doesn't have the faith? Yeah. Because you cannot receive any other sacrament without baptism. So we say that the fundament, no, not necessarily, that's not a good word. The gateway to all the other sacraments mm -hmm. is baptism. Of course, Christ is the primordial sacrament. So, and the church is the fundamental sacrament. But the gateway to all other sacrament is baptism been baptized already. Yeah. And then the baptism is valid. One. Yeah. Can they so if it mm -hmm. can they be say someone you're going down the road and you see someone that's had a bad breath and he's he's very sorry for his sins and he asked you he says he's never been baptized and he asked you to baptize him and give him the last right. Can you do that? If the person is the point of death and he expresses faith, he could be baptized, he should be baptized. Well, can you do that? Like if you were driving down the road and you saw Why not? If somebody, you go into an accident scene and somebody's panting for air and he's dying and say, Father, I believe in Christ, would you baptize me? Why not? And, and you know, when we talk about baptism, there are three types of baptisms. We have the baptism, the ordinary regular baptism that we do. Mm -hmm. We also have baptism by desire. Somebody at a point of death, you know, would desire baptism but will not get access to the sacrament. The faith of the person is a matter. And uh, there are people who were not baptized even in the early times of the church. And these people, you know, in the early times of the church, uh, were not baptized, you know, they postponed their baptisms, but some of them suffered for their faith and died. They were killed because of the faith. You know, that's the baptism by blood. Yeah. Would you clarify what uh, Sri said um, about the, that she said that if you've been baptized, like the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it's, you know, and it's a valid like, like one of us here that's mm -hmm. got a serious illness, mm -hmm. and we are, you know, Christian, we've been baptized. Now, are we eligible for the anointing of the sick, or we have to be completely Catholic? No. When you are, if you are baptized in the church or somewhere, baptized in, in Protestant church. church. Protestant church. church. Some of them are yeah, you know, catechumen in danger of death are regarded as members of the church. Well, catechumens haven't been baptized. Yeah, but catechumen, no, that's why I'm talking about the baptism of desire. If the person is a catechumen mm -hmm. and in danger of death, mm -hmm. he is or she is treated like a full baptized Catholic. They get a Catholic yeah, because yeah. because they are catechumen, yeah. they have the desire. Yeah, well, I'm talking it, about like now. I'm talking about like, like the now, ones that now, are baptized now. already. I'm talking about you know okay. at this point in time, not near in death, but a serious illness. Mm -hmm. Because I know I did call about Randy. Uh, and they had said, uh, Father McDonald said you had to be Catholic to participate in the anointing of the sick. Because I know we can't take mass, so I'm sure that's part of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, so you know, the, the sacraments, all the sacraments are not just separate entities. We, we for um, distinction's sake, we talk about seven traditional sacraments. All the sacraments are one. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I kept on saying baptism in the church is the gateway to all the other sacraments. You could have been baptized somewhere, you know. The church has to assess whether that baptism is valid or not. And are they, if the baptism is valid, you are not going to be baptized again. You are going to be received into the church. That makes you a full member of the church to participate fully. You know, um, before Vatican II, for instance, the Tridentine Mass, the catechumen were dismissed after the readings. The second part of the mass, they were not allowed to partake because they were no full members of the church. We still do that. That's yeah. So the sending off, you know, 
So if you are not a Catholic and you are sick, we can pray, but we won't call that a sacrament. It doesn't prevent the priest from coming to pray for you. We can pray for you, but as I said, in order not to confuse the use of the oil with any other healing, we are not allowed to use the oil for other healing purposes. Although the oil is meant for healing, but it has to be used within the sacramental setup so that people will see the distinction between the sacrament and then the prayers of healing. Yeah. But the grace of God, let me get this clear, is not restricted to only the sacrament. God's grace is not restricted to only the sacrament. Otherwise, we'll be limited, limiting the mercy and the love of God. But we say the sacraments are the ordinary means through which we encounter Christ and receive the divine life of grace. But it doesn't mean that God's dealing with us is limited to the sacrament. Does it make, yeah. make sense? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Can I make yeah. it simpler? Yeah, okay. If, for example, I came from another faith, mm -hmm. I came to RCIA, mm -hmm. which I'm expressing, you know, that I'm going to be Catholic. Yeah. Because I'm coming to RCIA. Now, I'm in danger of death. I had been baptized already. And then I'm in danger of death. Mm -hmm. And I want my sins to be forgiven. I want, now can I avail the sacrament of healing? The sacrament of the sin? Yeah, if you bring in the danger of death, every rule changes. Okay. okay. You know, in okay. the empirical motives, that is something different. You know, in every sacrament, when is for the danger of death, we got to twist the rule, you know? But if it's not a danger of death, because otherwise, then they anoint you the next time you want to go to confession, the next time you want to receive communion, what do we do? Yeah, yeah, right. So is that the Yeah, because so if the person is in danger of death and he's a catechumen, he could be baptized there and then. Because he's a catechumen, he had already expressed the faith. Already, yeah. yeah, he has a yeah. desire. The, the desire, mm -hmm. okay. So the catechumen are canon? Pardon me? Or yeah. Candidate. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, my, my little helpful explanation is that if you've been baptized in a proper baptism, mm -hmm. you're a member of the one body of Christ. There's only one body. Yeah. And you are, you are in, but, but the visible unity is not, it's defective because of, the, of our split. We're not unity, we're not in full unity. Okay. Uh, and but you gotta you gotta express the same articles of faith. So in that way, that's why we go through this process. That one must be entered into a full, full communion, church, mm -hmm. and a full expression of the faith, and then you are what we call Catholic. Uh, so even though all have been baptized are truly Catholic, don't realize it in, in, in essence, because there is only one body. Uh, it is not a proper communion yet. And so that's, that's what we're working on right here. Working on. Yeah, you know Vatican II says that uh, all other religious communities, you know, members of other religious communities are saved, you know, they could be saved. They have elements of ecclesial communion. But they are not in full communion because they don't have the fullness. And so when we talk about people coming from other faith, and Karen also talk about even anonymous Christians. People who are Christian but they don't even know that they are Christians. You know, the RCIA or, or being a catechumen or a candidate, you know, is to prepare you to get into full communion, as he said, with the church. You know, but before somebody takes that bold step to say, I want to be in full communion with the church, the person is saying, you know, I have the initial faith, I believe. Because we need that initial faith given by God, and then we build and deepen that faith. And that is why we're saying that, why will you 
get out from your home and come and stay here for one hour. You come here because you see something and you want it. You desire. You know, so that's why I'm saying if it's a question of death, the desire thing is there. And even, even if the point of death, you couldn't get access to the priest, the baptism of desire works for you. Because you are a, a candidate or a catechumen. Okay? Yeah. But you have to be in full communion with the church. And that is through either baptism or reception into communion with the church. It doesn't mean that you are not a Christian. You were. But you were not in full communion. Because they said the fullness eh, of salvation of the church is or uh, subsists that's what, what Vatican II says. Vatican I said is the Catholic Church, Vatican II says subsist in the Catholic Church. In other words, other churches and denominations have the means of salvation. But the fullness as given by Christ is in the church. The sacraments, the word of God, you know. So you come to full communion, then you will be able to participate in the fullness of the church's life. It's like you join any society. You know, I remember when I, I, I joined the Knights, you know, before I got fully initiated, there were certain parts I could join. Although I was a priest, certain parts I could not join. Until I finished my initiation ceremony, then I could go throughout the, the ritual, join them throughout the ritual. That is how it is. Unless you become a full member, you do not enjoy the fullness of that communion. And this happened because the early church, you know, before you become a member of the church, somebody in the church has to propose you. And they have to make sure you are not a spy. Because early Christians were being reported or being killed by people who, under cover, came to join them when they were worshipping in the catacombs, you know, in the tombs. You know, so all these traditions have come up. That is why you go through all this ritual of election and the ritual of uh, uh, right. picking a name and the rites that you go through before you are fully incorporated into the church to participate sacramentally in the full life of the church. In the form of the sacrament, uh, you mentioned forgiveness of sins. Does that cover mortal sin as well? You know, reconciliation does also take part in place in the sacrament of anointing or sick. You know, at times you go to anoint somebody, you say, Father, I want to go to confession. So we combine the two. Okay? But how about somebody who is in a coma? He cannot confess. So we rely on the mercy of God. You know? And that's why I said we cannot limit the mercy and love of God to only the sacrament. The sacraments are the ordinary and the surest way to know that something has taken place within you. You know? But that does not mean that God does not work outside the sacraments. Yeah. But if the person is sick and he can talk, or she can talk, and he has mortal sin within himself or herself, there's no, nothing wrong to ask for the sacrament of reconciliation within the anointing. And that could be done. What, what hope? He still considers. No, the hope is, you know, when you ask me what hope, I am not Christ. The hope is that it's Christ who saves. 
I cannot tell you this or that. It depends on the person's disposition. It depends on the person's faith and love. You know? His but faith is strong. Yeah, so when you ask me yeah. what hope, I cannot tell you. Yeah. But if you say, can he receive the sacrament, then I can answer that question. I hope you get my point. If you ask me, can he receive the sacrament, my answer will be no. No. Because she has abandoned the faith and he hasn't shown any positive step of coming back to her faith. No, he hasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you see, one thing that we need to get clear, you cannot say, pick and choose what you love about the church. You know, I want the sacrament of penance and reconciliation because it, it gives you emotional liberation. Or I like anointing because it strengthens. How about baptism? No. So that's why I'm saying the sacraments are all one. You know, yeah. didn't get the sacrament of healing you know, Yeah, if, if he wants, you know, because if any priest comes, he's going to ask of her background and he's going to ask her if she is prepared, you know, to be received into the church. If he says no, you cannot do it. It's not, it's, not, it's not a matter of being here. Yeah. It's a matter of being convinced that, no, I need to go back to my faith. I still believe. Yeah. You know, that is it. Because any priest that you call, he comes there, he's going to ask her. And there will be some kind of ritual for her to be received, although he's in a sick bed, deceiving the church before he could receive any other sacrament. Be through confession, re brought back into the church in full communion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yes, he would need reconciliation. That's all he has to mm -hmm. desire. Yeah, that and, and but that you know, but when we are talking about these sacraments, that's why I talk about ex opere operantis. Your inner disposition and faith is necessary. You know, the sacraments are not magic. That oh, Father says the words that applies whatever and, and is there. In order, you know, for it to be fruitful, no, well, 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 but in any case, in any case, in anybody uh, who had been in the faith and led the faith for a long time, you know, had to call and uh, we, we have to ask a few questions and if he's willing to become a Catholic, you know, and if we are convinced about what he's saying, uh, we hear his confession or her confession and absorb the person, the person can resume the sacramental life again. Yeah. You know, the church, you know, one thing, the church is not there to, to put a barrier between people and God. The church is there to help people. But you know, Jesus will never force himself into somebody's life. It depends on you. You know, even when the people of Israel were hungry and God gave them manna, they had to wake up early in the morning to go and gather the manna. You got to do your part and Christ will do his part. And that is it. So, although espera operato, there's the need for ex opera operantis. Your disposition, your faith, and your desire for the sacrament is equally important. My dad was dying and he was born Catholic. priest that I talked to at St. Joseph's here in 1983. I talked to him about that very thing. And he told me what I had to do because I was the only Catholic in the family. Mm -hmm. I had to go to him mm -hmm. and ask him if he would be willing to take his last ride. Yeah. And I said, I did. And God said, yes, finally. That's how I'm At first he said, no. But then I started hanging my head and he knew I was crying so he said, okay. <laughs> 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 my mom. I, I went first to my mother. Mm. All you got to do is do that. You know, because, because what is the point in administering a sacrament to somebody who does not believe in it? You know, it's, it's, like, it's like throwing a, a soap to a dog. He doesn't need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, you just said that sacraments aren't magic? No, they are not magic. Okay, I'm a little... 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm a little confused um, with communion. Mm -hmm. When the consecration happens, mm -hmm. that's not magic? No. I don't, I mean, I, I don't it's, it's, it's supernatural. Yeah. It's, so that host is the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. We talked about what if someone goes up, they're not Catholic, they just they want to fit in, they don't want to look off, whatever reason. Mm -hmm. If that host goes into their mouth, mm -hmm. is that Jesus? Yeah, there we are talking about two things here, the validity and the fruitfulness. So when a person who is not a Catholic receives it, it's not valid. So, but, they still but it's still a body of Christ. Of the body of Christ. Yeah. It's just the graces yeah. that come with that. It will be different. Because it's, it's a question of your faith. It's a question of faith. Because the, I said it's not magic. Because it's not because it is consecrated and it's a body of Christ. You know. I mean, Excuse me, say it falls down and the, the dog picks it and the dog has received Christ. The faith is important. Because in the eyes of faith is the body of Christ. And why is faith? Because Jesus says so. Otherwise, it's mere bread. You know, when, when, when you take a camera... Concentration, it is mere bread to someone who doesn't have faith. No, the, the, the essence is there. But whether it's going to have a laicity, fruitfulness, or validity for the person who takes it without faith. Okay. It's supposed to do something for you. What's the point when you receive a sacrament it doesn't do anything for you? Because it inculcates grace. And that grace is based on faith. The faith of the sick person is always necessary. You know? So through the consecration, so it is the priest who says these words of consecration and it is Christ who transforms the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And uh, um, uh, uh, their, 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 their scholastic fathers, Aquinas and others, who say that the accidents, you know, the color, you know, the texture remain bread, but the essence, you know, the substance is changed. But if you take a video camera to capture the bread on the host, it will capture bread. It takes the camera that has the lens of faith to capture. Christ in it. So if the lens is not there, although it's the body of Christ, it might not be fruitful to you. And, uh, Father, um, I have a, a, war, a co worker that, that said, um, because I said, uh, once the Jesus said, This is my body, because he's God, it becomes what he says it is. Although the accidents are still bred and wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? But she said, she told me, well, it's not, but if you, in faith, um, it becomes Jesus if you believe. But I was taught that whether no. you believe or not, it is Jesus. No. Through the consecration, it is the presence of Christ. Right. Okay. Well, that does not depend on whether the person sitting in the pew yeah. believes or not. Right. But okay. Its fruitfulness whether will be different. Whether, uh, yes, yeah. De depend on where this was. Yeah, yes. yes. Okay. Yeah, in one of our earlier classes, we had talked about the grace of God being a gift. Mm -hmm. And I think with the Latin that you mentioned that I can't read right now, <laughs> but that's the part of having to receive the gift. So yeah. having the faith is the reception of the gift. So it's, it's both. Uh, it's yeah, both but it doesn't become Christ because you believe. Whether you believe or not, Lord. it is still Jesus. You know, it's ontologically, it's the body of Christ. Because Jesus said, Tuto estin to suma mu labete fagete. Tuto estin. You know, the confusion here is the word estin. The Greek word estin is is. And people say the word estin is either figurative, E S T I N, either figurative or real. You know, Tuto estin to suma mu. This is my body. La bete fagete. Take and eat. But you know, fagete comes from the word, the infinitive, fagien. Fagien means to masticate, not just to eat. So literal translation would be take and chew. Fagete. 
take and chew, masticate. You know, so if it's symbolic, why do you masticate? And he said, anybody that is the body of Christ, you know, in mortal sin is guilty of sinning against the body of Christ. So if it's just figurative, why will you sin against the body of Christ when you take it unworthily? So, you know, you know, it tells you that la better forget her and tell you being guilty, you know, sinning against the body of Christ means that the body of Christ is real, is the real presence of Christ, not just a manifestation of Christ. You know, in, in, in the olden days, uh, you were not allowed even to, to break it, you were not allowed even to you know, to chew, you were allowed to keep it on your tongue until it melts on its own. But I'm telling you, the Greek word used by Christ himself in the institution is forget it. That symbolically tells you that it's something that has to be, you know, chewed. So if it's not the flesh, and that's why Jesus goes on to say, my body is real food and my flesh, uh, my blood uh, is real drink. Well, Tara was, was confirmed like 30 years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. No, what, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But I'm using this to show that Jesus meant that it is his body, not figurative. I use the verb to show that Jesus is saying that the body has to be, you know, masticated, fagin, you know. So if it has to be masticated, then he is saying that it is his real body. Otherwise, why do you have to masticate? Okay. So thank you. It's been wonderful uh, sharing uh, the word of God together. And I thank you for your responses. You know, it makes the class lively when all these questions are flowing from all angles. It tells me people are thinking about the faith. And it's necessary. You know, I used to tell my students back home that we should allow all kinds of questions to surface in the lecture hall. And I said, this is not a pulpit in the church. Whatever concerns has to be addressed, addressed in the lecture hall. Otherwise, sociologists and other departments will pick that same question and run their own direction if theologians don't answer the questions. You know, so I love to listen to questions and we share. I'll tell you what I know. If I'm not sure, I'll tell you. I'll find it out, and the next time I'll tell you. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, one and a half hours. You must be becoming martyrs to survive me for one and a half hours. <laughs> you are great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Spirit of the living God, Fall afresh on us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us, melt as mold us, feel us. You us, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we thank you for the one and a half hour we've spent with you. We thank you for enlightening our minds and hearts to draw closer to you. We ask you to protect us as we go back to our homes. Strengthen us to be able to share whatever we have noticed today. Strengthen us to be able to draw closer to you and to be filled with the grace of your salvation. Let us be the shining example for people through what we say and what we do. Bless all of us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you and God bless you. Have a good night.